be seated. There are a couple of lines in that song that I wanted to just kind of take a moment to bring to your attention. There was a line that says, I know that I am loved, I know that I am safe. And it caused me to at least want to take a moment to remind us of what safe is from a Christian perspective. Because safe from a Christian perspective and safe from the world's perspective, are two entirely different things. Safety from a worldly perspective is the avoidance of bad health. Safety from a world's perspective is the avoidance of a loss of a job. Safety from the world's perspective is everything that would cause us to physically feel safe. But safety from an eternal or a Christian perspective should be the reminder that our true safety is found in a relationship with Jesus Christ because when we have a relationship with Jesus Christ, we are what? We are eternally safe. And that's why those two lines, I know that I am loved, I know that I am safe, is followed up by because even in the fire, to live is Christ and to die is gain. So great theology within the the lines of that song that help us to drive back to a point we make frequently here, which is this. Well, two points that we make frequently. Your greatest need is always a spiritual need, and it's important to have an eternal perspective. Because if you don't have those two things at the forefront of your faith, you will be frustrated. I promise you will be frustrated by circumstances. Because the reality is what? We don't always have perfect health. I'm looking around and I know that there are those within this room who have battled COVID. And it was a struggle and maybe even continues to be a struggle. Did God leave you in the midst of that? No, he wants to use those things to help us, to drive us back again to our greatest need is always a spiritual need and we always have to have an eternal perspective. Does that mean that he doesn't care for our physical needs? No. In fact, we said in recent weeks, like two weeks ago, when we were looking at the threefold ministry of Jesus, remember he taught to increase the learning of his followers He preached these weighty messages because he realized and he knew to the core of his being that everyone needed him. And then he had a healing ministry to confirm his identity, but also he healed because he genuinely cared for the needs of people, genuinely cared for them. He looked on them with compassion. And so we look at this and we say, An eternal perspective doesn't eliminate all of those other things, but it brings into focus those things which are the most important. Well, we pick up in our study again this morning, our chronological study of the Gospels in Matthew chapter number 10. Go ahead and in your Bibles, turn there. We'll get there in just a moment. Matthew chapter number 10. Again, in the last couple of weeks, Jesus taught, he preached, And he healed. And uh, those three things were a part of his ministry. We said last week that as he brings the disciples together and they're under his guidance and they're witnesses to this threefold ministry, uh, Jesus spends considerable time training them because they often didn't understand what he was teaching, what he was preaching, or why he did or didn't heal. I want to say that again. Jesus spent considerable time with the disciples. Why? Because a lot of times they didn't understand what he was teaching. They didn't comprehend what he was preaching. And they couldn't get the times that he did or did not heal. Sometimes it didn't make sense to them. Can you identify with that? Are there some teachings of Jesus that you have a hard time wrapping your mind around? Are there some some messages that are preached that you say, that's a hard, that's a weighty message 
That's hard for me to just simply say, yes, I will align with that. Or maybe I don't even fully grasp the theology that is being taught by Jesus in this particular place or in, the, in a section of God's word. Do you ever spend time saying, I don't understand why God didn't heal in this particular instance? I, I don't understand why this person did see healing and why this person didn't see healing. You ever found yourself in those positions of not completely understanding the teaching, not completely getting the preaching, and not fully understanding the ways of God? If you've ever felt that way, say, I have. If you haven't felt that way, you'll get there. If you haven't had any trouble understanding the teaching of God's word, you just haven't spent enough time in it. Because even as your pastor, there are times that I come to God's word and I'm like, man, I don't get that fully, Lord. Help to teach me. Holy Spirit, guide my mind. Guide my thoughts. Help my understanding. The disciples, they had to spend a lot of time with Jesus because they didn't fully get it all the time. I spent most of my life surrounded by the teachings of the Lord. That's, I, I, I just did. I grew up in a Christian home for which I'm very thankful. I, I went to a Christian school for the early part of my life. I received a lot of teaching as it relates to God's word, but I'm still learning and I'm still having my understanding corrected by the Lord on a frequent basis. And I'm okay with that. I didn't used to be so okay with that. I think the older you get, the more you become okay with the Lord kind of changing your way of thinking. It's maybe a little bit of an odd thing. You spend a little bit of the early part of your life ready to soak up the teaching of God's word. Then you feel like you've got enough that you can just kind of handle it. And so you spend a portion of your life thinking, I already have it figured out. I'll tell you what I, what I think about God's word. And then the older you get, at least Lord willing, you get to this point where you say, okay, you know what? I'm actually still learning. I actually still need the Lord to correct my ways of thinking, to correct my motives, to correct my attitudes, to correct my theology. Because the reality is this, and this is a humble thing to admit, but the reality is this. There's not a single one of us, I don't believe, that is going to get to heaven and God says, you know what, you had it all right. Your theology was so spot on, you never missed even the finest point of doctrine. <laughs> Some people actually are so convinced uh, of their doctrinal stances that I think they, they really believe they're going to stand before the Lord and the Lord's going to be like, you nailed it, buddy, good job. I just don't think any of us are at that point. Now, we seek to rightly divide the word of truth. We teach and we preach through entire sections so that we don't just kind of grasp something here and grasp something there and end up with a very distorted theology that doesn't accurately reflect God's word. We want to do our best. But a humble acknowledgement is that I'm still learning, and I trust that you're here because you're still learning too. We can identify with the disciples in that way. But do you remember what we learned last week? Jesus kept teaching. The disciples kept learning. He kept bringing them in and keeping them close. And now he's getting ready to send them out. He brought them in for training. He sends them out for ministry. He brought them in for learning. Sends them out for impact. And that's where we're going to pick up this morning where he's sending them out. Gives the name of the 12 apostles, first few verses there of Matthew 10. Now we pick up in verse number 5. Follow along as we read. Matthew 10, 5. These 12, listed there in verses 2 through 4. These 12, Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. As you go... Preach this message. The kingdom of heaven is near. Heal the sick. Raise the dead. Cleanse those who have leprosy. Drive out demons. Freely you have received. Freely give. Do not take along any gold or silver or copper in your belts. Take no bag for the journey or extra tunic or sandals or a staff. For the worker is worth his keep. Whatever town or village 
you enter, search for some worthy person there and stay at his house until you leave. As you enter the home, give it your greeting. If the home is deserving, let your peace rest on it. If it is not, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, shake the dust off your feet when you leave that home or town. I tell you the truth, it will be more bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. Let's study God's word together. We go back to verses 5 and 6 and Jesus gives a very specific mission to these 12 disciples, these 12 apostles, these sent ones. He's going to give them a very specific mission. Look, look there with me. It says, do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, it's very important to realize because some people are frustrated when they read this. and They say, why would Jesus only send them to the house of Israel? Why would he say, don't go to the Samaritans? Why would he say, don't go to the Gentiles? Why would he say that? Doesn't Jesus love the whole world? I thought John 3.16 says, for God so loved the world. Why would Jesus send out his disciples and say this? Don't go to the Gentiles. Don't go to the Samaritans. Only go to the house of Israel. Why would Jesus do that? That seems contrary to everything that I thought I knew about Jesus, about God, about his mission in this world. Well, you shouldn't be frustrated by any specific mission. We see later on the Great Commission, as it's called, where Jesus says, here's what I want you to do. Go and make disciples of all nations. You can find that in Matthew 28. Go and make disciples of all nations. He doesn't limit it there to just the house of Israel. You find in Acts 1.8, Jesus says, he's getting ready to ascend. Some of the last words before he does, and he says, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and what? To the ends of the earth. Just because Jesus limited this mission doesn't mean that he limits his overall mission. We have missionaries to very specific regions. The Vances are missionaries to Colombia. Are we frustrated that they are not missionaries to Brazil? Are we frustrated that they are not missionaries in the United States? Are we frustrated that they're not going to, and you can just kind of name the place, are we frustrated by the specifics of their mission? No, that's what God has called them to, the brothers who we get the privilege now of supporting. We just started their support at the beginning of this year. They are missionaries to Poland. Are we frustrated that they are not missionaries in another part of the world? I trust that you're not frustrated by a specific mission. The reality is also this. I believe Northwinds Church exists in this part of the county, this part of Wayne County, this part of the region, to minister to people in the surrounding areas. The reality is that our mission is not Cleveland. The reality is that our mission is not Columbus. Now, does that mean that if, if an opportunity would present itself, that we would never uh, send anyone to minister in Columbus, never send anyone to minister in Cleveland, never send anyone to Akron, to Canton? No, it doesn't mean that we would never do that. But if we aren't focused on the area in which God has placed us, we will find ourselves as that proverbial person that... If you don't have a target, you are sure to hit it. And so we know that we want to have a focus on the people in West Salem, the people in Burbank, Pleasant Home, Congress, in the surrounding areas. We know that God has, I believe to the core of my being, that God has planted this church here to reach the people in this area. Now, should somebody in Akron be frustrated that we are not ministering to them? I don't believe that they should, nor should we be frustrated that those in Akron are not ministering to us. 
So Jesus gives them a specific mission for this time of ministry. Let's take it from an organizational standpoint down to a more personal standpoint. There are some within this congregation, the church of God here, who have been called to minister to our youth. Now, am I frustrated that not everyone is called to minister to youth? I'm not frustrated by that. There are some within our church family who are called to minister to the children. Am I frustrated that not everyone is called to minister to the children? No, that's not frustrating to me at all. Am I frustrated that there are some who are not called to help lead the ladies' ministry, lead the men's ministry, that there are not some who are called to help with the janitorial duties here? Am I frustrated that not everyone has the same exact specific mission? I'm not frustrated by that at all. Now we have an overall general mission that applies and extends to everyone. 2 Corinthians 5, we are his ambassadors we are the ones who have been left here on the earth to be his, uh, to share his message. The message, as it talks about, the message of reconciliation. That's an overall general mission, but Jesus is going to send them on a specific mission. And I believe that for all of God's people, he has a specific call upon your life. Your call may be slightly different through different portions of your life but the reality is this god wants to use you as a part of his work so there's a specific call and a specific mission for these 12 disciples these 12 apostles there are some who have a specific call upon their life to be ministers of the gospel of jesus christ i did not expect that call to be extended to my life. I am not one who has grown up in a family of pastors. I'm a first-generation pastor. Uh, there's nobody that I look back to and say, okay, well, yeah, well, since this person was a pastor, this person was a pastor, then that's what I'm supposed to do. God clearly put a call upon my life when I wanted to do other things. I would have so loved to have been a lawyer. I just enjoy a good opportunity to not just debate but win a debate <laughs> some of you are like I, me too me too like it plays out on facebook all the time well here's the reality nobody wins on facebook <laughs> if you feel that your call is to be a facebook warrior i'm just going to ask you to re-examine um, the specifics of that call uh, but I do believe that God has placed a specific call upon people's lives to minister for him in his work. And that would be the case for these 12 that Jesus is sending out. Now, their call was ultra-specific, right? He goes up to them and, follow me. And then he comes to the point where he has trained them for a couple of years, and he says, all right, now go out. And here's what you're going to do. It would be impossible to miss that call. There are a few things about a call upon a person's life. I get people that ask me sometimes, and I actually appreciated whenever Caleb was going through the process of, of deciding which college he was going to go to, and we met with one of the professors at Cedarville University uh, who was a part of the theology department there. One of the very first things that he said wasn't, uh, hey, let me tell you about what Cedarville has to offer. Hey, let me tell you about all this good stuff. He said, tell me about the call of God upon your life. What does that look like? Because if you can't go back to the knowledge of a call of God upon your life, you know what you're going to do before too awful long? You're going to quit. You're going to quit. Because ministering for the Lord is not just fun. It's not just victories. Uh, it is a lot of challenge in a lot of different ways. There are times, and I'm so thankful that the Lord has seen fit to bring both Kirk and I through some dark times of ministry. Uh, and I can share that because we've had the chance to share our lives together for uh, such an extended period of time. God has been gracious to us in allowing us that. Uh, Pastor Kirk and his wife Donna have been an extraordinary blessing to Kim and, and myself. 
not just here at North Winds, but throughout our lives, and, and we're very thankful for that. But I know for Kirk, and I know for myself, if we wouldn't be able to go back to a call of God upon our lives, we would just throw in the towel, would have thrown in the towel a long time ago, and even knowing the call. There have been times when, you know what, I just don't need that. I told Kim out in Pennsylvania, I said, I'm done. I said, I've preached my last message. I've done my last church work. And she was gracious enough to just kind of let me ramble. And uh, she, she knew in her, in her core that the Lord would not allow me to have any sense of ease until I was back doing the work that he has called me to. I tried to do construction, which I love construction. I went to work every day, and, uh, and I felt so unfulfilled because I wasn't doing what God had called me to do. The call of God upon the disciples here was, for this specific mission, I want you to go to the lost sheep of Israel. And as you go, it says in verse 7, preach this message. Now, do you remember? We talked about the threefold ministry of Jesus. We're going to see two of the three in the next couple of verses. We just saw, as you go, preach. So you remember the threefold part of Jesus' ministry. He taught, he preached, and he healed. We're not going to see teaching as part of the disciples' ministry at this time. Anybody want to venture a guess as to why? Now, you don't have to shout that out at me. But do you remember what we said about the disciples? They were having a hard time learning themselves. They were having a hard time grasping what Jesus was really trying to teach about who he was and what God had called him to do. Even as we get towards the end of Jesus' time here on the earth, which means that it's getting towards the end of his time of training the disciples. Do you remember what happened? He tells them, hey, I'm going to have to go into Jerusalem and everything that was written about me in the prophets is going to be fulfilled. I'm going to be crucified and three days later I'm going to rise again. And it says the disciples didn't understand anything of what he was talking about. It would be hard for Jesus to send the disciples out with a teaching ministry when they didn't understand even yet most of the basics of what he was doing and why he was doing it. But they could go out with these messages that the Lord had given to them. And really, it was one specific message. What was that message? The kingdom of heaven is near. You might be in a position where you say, you know what, I probably couldn't go out and have any sort of a teaching ministry. Some of you would be able to do so, and some of you are using what God has taught you to teach others, and you ought to continue doing so. But even if you aren't able to go out and have a teaching ministry, you can have a preaching ministry. And let me explain what I mean by a preaching ministry. Pre to preach is to proclaim. To preach is to proclaim. I, I don't particularly like being called just a preacher. I, I'd much rather be a pastor who shepherds the hearts of people, gets the opportunity to preach and to teach, but ultimately I, I love being a pastor uh, to, to have the, the entirety of the ministry uh, as part of what God has called me to. But all of us are called to preach or proclaim a message. Do you think people right now are wondering... And there seems like a lot of upheaval in our world. Wow, we've gone through uh, a pandemic for a reasonably lengthy period of time. And when is that going to end? And does anything of this have anything to do with the end of the world? Uh, do you think people are at least considering some of those things? I believe they many times are. Does it give us all the opportunity to proclaim a message of hope? Hope that is found in the person of Jesus Christ. Hope that is found in a deliverer from, from the, the, the sin that has so long just tied us down. Hope for a, a, an eternity with the Lord. Hope that even when physical things crumble, 
We have a foundation in Jesus that is secure. Do you think that's a message that we can go out with? So even if you're not at a place where you say, I, you know what, I could teach the finer aspects of Scripture, the finer aspects of doctrine. I could go out and I could teach. I want to say to all of you that you are still to be his messengers. Jesus sent the disciples out knowing that they were ill-equipped to be able to teach through the Old Testament and show him to be the Messiah. Knowing that they were ill-equipped for maybe some of the questions that they would face. But he sent them out to preach a message. The kingdom of heaven is near. And can I say to all of you this morning, if you have not turned in faith to Jesus, the kingdom of heaven is near. We don't know when the time will be that the church will be raptured. And there will be a, a time when they, the world enters into a seven-year tribulation and the wrath of God is poured out upon this earth. You think things are, are bad now? We look, in, as a youth group, we've been looking in the book of Revelation and we're able to see the things that are yet to come. We can all go out and proclaim this message that the kingdom of heaven is near. There's hope that is found in Jesus Christ. There's security in knowing that your safety doesn't rely on a physical safety. I can't imagine the weight that that must be to think that physical safety is the penultimate of life. To think that Something that we know for every person is going to go away. That's the reality in which we live. Other than, than the ones that we know of, Elijah and Enoch, everyone else has met the same fate. We need to acknowledge that, that if our physical safety is the peak of what we think our existence is, we're going to eventually be disappointed. Because it will decline, it will fail. But if we understand that our spiritual safety is where we truly find peace, then whenever the physical safety declines, when it's up in the air, when it's uncertain, there's still a great degree of peace, security, and eternal safety there. So he sends them out and he says, preach this message. And then also the second part, which was the third part of Jesus' ministry, the healing ministry. Remember in the first part of chapter 10, Jesus calls them together and he gives them authority. And now he sends them out and he says, whenever you go out, preach this message. And then heal the sick, verse 8. Raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Freely you have received, freely give. Now it's interesting, the foresight that God has in his word. Because I've sat with people before who have said to me, I don't think a pastor ought to ever get paid. Listen, verses like this. Freely you have received, freely give. You ought to be willing to, to minister and not take a salary. I've had people that have held to that position, and I, I love the foresight that God has in knowing that there would be those with that mindset that would say, hey, everything you do for the Lord, you ought to just be willing to do it, and whatever happens, happens. Now, it's interesting because he follows that up by giving some very specific instruction. But before I get to that, let me just kind of give the summary of what Jesus is saying here. He's saying to his disciples, you've received the grace of God and you didn't pay for it. And don't you dare make someone else pay for what you've received freely. The free gift of God, salvation, is not something that can be sold. The free gift of God... The healing ministry that I'm sending you out with, that is not something that you sell. You, oh, you're blind? I tell you what, for, for $50, I'll go ahead and I'll heal you. 
You should never sell the services of God. They're not for sale. The grace of God is not for sale. The, the ministry of God is not for sale. It should never be for sale. And you say, well, nobody would ever seek to do that. No one would ever be in a position where they would say, you know what, hey, I think I can, I think I can make money off of this. You do realize that an entire church organization sold indulg indulgences for centuries. They profited off of people's fears. You do realize that there are TV ministries that will tell you this. You send us money, and we'll send you a little prayer thing, a little prayer cloth. And if you'll just send us money, we'll send you this prayer cloth, and then you'll have your prayers answered. They're selling, well... I don't think they're selling the work of God. They're selling something they're pretending is the work of God. Okay, let's be honest about that. That's not actually the work of God. You have direct access to the Father. You know that, that bowl of incense that we've talked about that our prayers go into and rise to the Father. Your prayers don't have to go through a prayer shawl before they get there. You have direct access to the Father. It can't be sold, and it can't be bought. If you have even, and listen, the support of the work of God is an important thing. But Pastor Kirk has said it. He said it just a few weeks ago. I say it again. The work of God in supporting the work of God, it is something that should be a part of the Christian's life. But you don't hear us up here trying to manipulate people in such a way that if you're not supporting God's work, if you haven't come to the point in your understanding of, of the Christian life that you are giving to his work, then God won't bless you and God won't do this. And No. If you've thought, well, hey, if I support the church, then God will allow me to have better health. You know what, if I do this, then God will... God is not a God to be manipulated. He is not someone who can be bought off. He can't be paid off. He's not a politician. Oh, wait, I didn't say that, did I? You know. But people did. They tried to buy the work of God. They tried to profit from it. We even see this in the early church. If you will, just flip over quickly to Acts chapter number 8. We find an interesting account here of a man by the name of Simon. Now, this is not Simon Peter. We'll just call him Simon the Sorcerer. In verse number 9, it says this. Now, for some time, a man named Simon had practiced sorcery in the city, and he had amazed all the people of Samaria. He boasted that he was someone great. And all the people, both high and low, gave him their attention and exclaimed, This man is the divine power known as the great power. They followed him because he had amazed them for a long time with his magic. But when they believed Philip as he preached the good news of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. So these ones who had been following Simon the sorcerer and had been amazed by him, they now come to realize that their only hope is found in Jesus. It says that they were then baptized, the men and the women of that area. Simon himself, verse 13 believed and was baptized and he followed philip everywhere astonished by the great signs and miracles that he saw now if you go down to verse number 18 it says this when simon saw that the spirit was given at the laying on of the apostles hands so the apostles would lay their hands on people and they would receive the holy spirit and whenever simon the sorcerer saw this he offered them the end of verse 18 he offered them money and said, give me also this ability, so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Peter answered, may your money perish with you, because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. Simon, the sorcerer who had been making a living with his magic, amazing people, sees this and says, this is even better. I can make even more as a result of this. 
Can I give you some money so that I can have what you have? And as Jesus sends out his disciples, he knows that there will be this worldly temptation with some that will say, you know what? I'll go ahead and charge for that service. I'll go ahead and say, well, the only way that you can receive that is if you give me money. But the gift of God cannot be purchased, and the gift of God should never be sold. It's been a part of God's call upon my life. I don't charge anyone for anything that I do. I, I do. I receive a salary from the church. So I don't charge people to do weddings. I don't charge people for counseling. I don't charge people for anything else. The, the, the services of God are not to be sold. I don't think they should ever be sold. And you say, well, that seems kind of counterintuitive. That seems as if it's almost speaking out of both sides of your mouth when you say you don't charge people, but you take a salary. Well, how is that? Again, the foresight of God is amazing in this passage because he says, freely you have received, freely given. Now follow it up in verse number nine. Freely you have received, verse eight, freely give. Now it says in verse number nine, do not take along any gold or silver or copper in your belts. Take no bag for the journey or extra tunic or sandals or a staff. Why? For the worker is worth his keep. Jesus says, don't be selling these services. Don't be going to people and saying, you know what? I can, I can cast that demon out if you will just pay me this amount of money. You know what? You've been blind. Here's the fee for me making you be able to see. You know what? You can't walk. Well, that's a little bit extra. You know what? You, you need this service. Well, here's how much it is. So Jesus says, no, the ministry of God, I want you to go out. And I don't want you to withhold anything from people. But the reality is this, as you go out, you should expect to be taken care of. In fact, you should so much expect to be taken care of that I don't want you to take any of, you, any of your own gold. I don't want you to take any of your own silver. I don't want you to take copper in your belts. I don't want you to take a bag for the journey. I don't want you to take any extra tunic. I don't want you to take sandals. I don't want you to even take a staff. I want you to go out and I want you to realize this, that as you go and you minister for me, you're to be taken care of. You're to be taken care of. The worker, as it says at the end of verse number 10, is worth his keep. Now, I'll just be honest with you. I have never felt the need to defend uh, receiving a salary from the church. I just have never felt the need, nor do I think that you want me to explain scripturally why that is appropriate you probably wouldn't support the work of the lord if you didn't think that was appropriate but i always am willing to teach the scriptures as they come to us and so since this is here it is important to understand that god's word does make clear that those who minister for him should be well taken care of in fact you can find in 1 Timothy chapter number 5, and if you want to flip over there, you can. I don't think the verse is going to be on the screen. But 1 Timothy chapter number 5, verse 17 says this. The elders who direct the affairs of the church well are worthy of double honor, especially those whose work is preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, do not muzzle the ox while it is treading out the grain, and the worker deserves his wages. The scriptures clearly teach that the ministry of the work of God is a calling. It is something worthy of pursuing in life. And if you follow that calling, you should be taken care of. We expect our missionaries to be fully supported and to be taken care of. I don't want our missionaries going out into the mission field and having to wonder where their next paycheck is is going to come from. God's word tells us the worker is worthy of his wages. I've been so excited about the work that the Vances are doing in Colombia. I'll be honest, it just makes me want to support more and more and more, and we have been able to increase their support. I don't know if I shared that with you 
at the beginning of this year that we increase their support again. Uh, they're planning churches. Uh, they, they had another church come to them and say, you know what, we've seen what God has been doing there. Will you guys actually take over our church as well? And they've been able, even in the midst of planning a church, to be able to help this church and get them on solid footing. They're worthy. Ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ are worthy of their wages. Now, that doesn't mean that there should be no accountability. That doesn't mean that, you know, there ought to be these exorbitant uh, wages and, and, and pastors living in mansions and various things like that. No, I don't think that that's at all what God calls us to. But I wanted to make sure that we understand what God's word says here. The services of God are never for sale. The grace of God, the salvation of God, the healing of God, it's never for sale. But those who minister for him should be taken care of. And I want to just say thank you so much for the way in which you take care of me and my family. The way that you take care of making sure that we can minister effectively. You know, there was a time whenever we went through the becoming an independent church that in the leadership that was here at the time and many of them still here knows that the question became is there going to be enough money for a salary and and I told them very I'm like hey listen I'll work another job this church is going to continue but that never became a necessary thing as a result of your faithfulness and God's faithfulness and I said often through that time, I'm like, I don't know how I'd actually be able to pull that off. <laughs> I don't know how I could effectively minister and be tied somewhere else and not be able to go and to meet with someone. Almost without exception, somebody says, hey, can I meet with you? I say, yeah, what's good for your schedule? Because I can flip mine around enough to be able to meet pretty much any time that you can. And it's a privilege and it's an honor to be able to minister for the Lord and it's always humbling to even come to these passages where the Lord lays out you know what those who minister for me should be taken care of but that's the word of God and I promise to preach it and teach it and so there it is he goes on to say whatever town or village you enter search for some worthy person there stay at his house until you leave as you enter the home give it your greeting if the home is deserving let your peace rest on it if it is not, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, shake the dust off of your feet when you leave that home or town. I tell you the truth, it'll be more bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. Now here's the thing, and there's a lot of cultural teaching that I don't have a time to go into this morning. But here's the basics of it. Jesus says, you know what, go to a place and I want you to stay there, and I want you, when you're ministering in that town, to continue to stay in that place until you leave. And if the town won't accept you, I want you to move on. And I want you to basically shake the dust off of your feet and say, I've done my part. I've shared with you the message. Judgment is now going to be upon you instead of the blessing of God they were going out and, and Jesus says here's what I want you to do in the towns here's what I want you to do in the cities I want you to go and I want you to preach I want you to heal I want you to cast out the demons raise people from the dead I want the blessing of God to be upon these areas just as it has been in my ministry I want it to be there but do you know what happened at Nazareth we just studied this not long ago Jesus goes there and because of the people he said I won't, I can't do many miracles there, I won't do it. And he moves on. And the reality is this, and we've said this time and time again, God is not obligated to be your peanut vendor. He's not obligated to come back again and again and again and again. If you are resisting the grace of God, you are in danger of judgment. Do not resist any longer. God wants his blessing upon your life. He sent out the disciples to say, here's what I want you to do. I want you to preach. I want you to heal. I want people to have the blessing of God. But if they don't want it, don't force it upon them. And that doesn't mean that we just give up on people. 
It doesn't mean that, you know, you share the gospel and they rejected it and you just say, oh, enough with you. But there does come a point, and I struggle with this in my own life. I want, <laughs> I want so badly to see everyone come to know Christ. An evaluation of my life about seven years ago was that I was spending so much time ministering to those who were pushing away the work of God that I was spending very little time ministering to those who wanted the work of God. I, I, I cared so much about these ones over here coming to realize you need Jesus. Oh my goodness, you need Jesus. How do you not realize you need Jesus? But I was sp spending such a disproportionate amount of time there that I wasn't doing what God had really called me to, and that is to train those to do the work of the ministry. In the Ephesians 4, equipping folks. And so that was a little bit of a rebuke of God upon my life that, you know what? And I, <laughs> there was a retired pastor who said to me one time, and it's changed my thinking, it really has. I was a little offended, if I'm being honest. I was offended the first time this was said to me. I don't get offended easily. And it wasn't as if I had this like reaction. That he never knew I was offended, I don't think. But uh, he said to me, he said, you know, Dave, you're nobody's savior. And I'm like, oh, oh, oh. But I want, I want them to know. I want them to realize. But that, that one statement, it changed. And the Lord used that in my life, that, that rebuke, so to speak, to remind me that just as the Apostle Paul says, you know, the things that I have entrusted you entrust to faithful men. And I have to be spending time in, in, in working with those who want the blessing of God in their life. Not that we ignore these. My heart is for evangelism. I do. I have a heart for those that don't know Jesus. But I'm thankful that the Lord has allowed me to have a better balance between the two. Here's where we are as we end this morning. What about the call of God upon your life? There's a general call that I talked about earlier, a general call to all followers of Jesus, that we are his ambassadors, that we are sharing, proclaiming this message, the good news of salvation in Jesus Christ, the good news that in the times, in the midst of difficult times in which we're living, there's hope. We can all be those messengers. Are you willing to be a part of God's work? Are you willing to, are you willing to allow him to use your life? We live in a consumer society. Just give and give to me, give to me, give to me, give to me. If you have made it your habit to simply come in and consume the blessing of God, I want you to start thinking about this. We come in for learning. We go out for ministry. We come in for training. We go out for impact. And that's not just me. It's not just Pastor Kirk. And it's not just Steve. It is for all of us. The call of God, a, a general call upon all of our lives is to be his ambassadors. Proclaim the message of good news, of salvation and hope in Jesus Christ. Will you join him in that? And if you say, you know what? I've kind of, I've kind of allowed myself to become so worked up over here that I'm not investing in anyone who really wants the work of God in their life. I want you to start considering that. People who come to me and say, I just, I just don't feel like I have much meaning in life. I just don't feel like, you know what I tell them almost without exception? Who are you investing in? Who are you investing in? All you see is yourself right now. If you don't see anyone else, you're going to continue to be frustrated. Who are you investing in? I ask that to all of you. Who are you investing in? Are you a part of God's work? Father, thank you so much for your word. Thanks for the truth of it. Thank you for allowing it to, I trust, change our minds, mold our thinking, bring us into conformity with who you are and what you desire in this world. God, I pray whether it's those who are gathered here together this morning or those who have tuned in online, I pray, Lord, that you would challenge their hearts to be ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ, to be ambassadors for you, to go out and boldly proclaim the message of hope and salvation that is found in no one else. Lord, for those who are 
in a position where they have heard the message and they've resisted and they've resisted and they've resisted. May today be the day that they say, you know what? I'm going to trust in Jesus. I'm going to place my faith in him. I believe that he's the son of God. I believe that he came and he died for my sin. I believe that he was raised to life. And I believe that he is the Messiah. Right now, I want to turn to him for my salvation, for my sin. God, I pray that today you would do your work in the hearts of your people. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to invite you to stand. We're going to sing.